<laughs> I, I too would sign on to your bill, Mike. Um, I, do, I do think, though, that, that in addition to that, we have to, as a representative in Washington, be willing to stand up any time we see those individual rights being abridged. We can look around us and see any number of examples of that, whether it's the Second Amendment, and we'll keep a close eye on the Chicago gun rights decision that's pending, whether it's the First Amendment. Let's look at, at arguments that this Supreme Court nominee has made a well solicitor general, and we may see some evidence that she doesn't really think the First Amendment is as absolute as I think it is. We see we see individual rights being taken away in the use of eminent domain. We see them by the government failing to exercise its role in Arizona, and we certainly see it with what I believe is unconstitutional health care legislation. Uh, I'll stand up and use that bully pulpit any chance I get. Thank you very much. Right, to the first question, would you make a commitment to stop the erosion of small, oh, I'm sorry, no, the individual rights? Absolutely, yes. I love hearing all this talk about the Constitution. That's the only place I'm looking for a job description. And I'm quite sure that the way it was written, the Constitution applies even in a time of crisis, which means we should be following the Fourth Amendment. No sneak and peek, uh, no indefinite holding of individuals. Those, that was all written to keep us safe from a potentially tyrannical government. And I think it was Benjamin Franklin who said, if you trade liberty for security, then you deserve neither, something to that effect. Um, so yeah, follow the Constitution. That will give us our freedoms. For a third question, what is the role of government? Specifically speaking about the Constitution, relative to states' rights. Okay. The uh, Constitution is a very interesting document uh, in which the states created the federal government. And the federal government had a certain number of things that the state allowed the federal government to do. And I was doing a little bit of reading and research, and the number came up, 95% of what's going on in government today. 95% is not authorized by the Constitution. We have got to get back to the basics, guys, because if we don't get back to the basics, it's like these other congressmen that are up there passing the health care bill. They said, how do you do this when it's not constitutional? And he says, we don't have time to worry about the Constitution. We've got to get this thing passed. Those people took an oath. The same oath that every one of us up here that served in the military has taken to support and protect and defend the Constitution. And I hate these stop signs. <laughs> This, this debate about, about state versus federal rights has been going on in our entire history. It goes back to Hamilton and, and Jefferson and Washington and a debate about, uh, about the proper role of government. Um, you know, I believe that we should be, it works in, it works in business and I believe it, is, it, it works in the military and I also believe it is what is envisioned by our, uh, by our founders. That is, decision making tends to get pushed down the hill as far as it possibly can. We have the preamble of the Constitution. We have the enumerated powers. And we have this little thing called the Tenth Amendment that the Supreme Court once referred to as a mere truism, and I think that was a very erroneous uh, decision. Um, I think that we have seen the growth of federal power over the last 60 to 70 years, specifically through the General Welfare Clause, most of all through the Commerce Clause, and I think it is time that we rolled that, that we started rolling that back. And we didn't see it until the mid 90s uh, any decision come out of the Supreme Court that indicated that they would do that. I think we see in the public now a, uh, a real urgency uh, to move in that direction towards states' rights and smaller government. I see the role of government as to just do for people only those few things that they can't do for themselves. In the few cases where we need to act as a collective, uh, as a country, other than that, people live their lives, uh, government should keep things fair between the states, guarantee our basic rights. And it's sad has come to this, but I don't have to see the state standing up and citing the 10th Amendment as a way to say, no, federal government, you are not supposed to be doing this. There's no community accountability with 
the federal government. When the Constitution was written, there was one, one representative for every 30,000 people. So there was a chance you'd bump into that person at the market, or your kids would hang out with their kids. Now we've got one rep for 500,000 people. So I like this, the state's um, power to the state house to get back to the community accountability. Well, uh, you know, I believe very deeply in the 10th Amendment. The 10th Amendment says very clearly that those powers are not authorized to the federal government nor prohibited to the states or left to the people, to the states and the people thereof. And having served at the local level now for going on seven years as a citizen legislator, in other words, I have to work a job <laughs> as well, I can tell you, we don't need the federal government trying to tell us how to run our communities. That's a big part of the problem. We have folks in Washington, D.C. who think they know better than us. Who think that somehow they tell you how to live your life. It'll be better for you and your family. And we need folks in Congress who understand not just the federal level, but the local level. And will fight to protect our local rights and local control. Thank you. <laughs> Finishing in terms of technology to secure our borders. Once we've done that, then we have to remove the economic incentive to illegally migrate to our country in the first place. So this, this is important because this means we have to we have to talk to the employers who back in May of 2009 there were 122,000 employers on E-Verify. That's not good enough. We need to have every employer on E-Verify, and we need to have every migrant worker that has an employment identification card so we can verify their right to lawfully work in this country. We do that, we can address the immigration. Thank you. What is my position on the amnesty? I always like to go back to call something called common sense. Somebody breaks into your house, uh, you call the sheriff, the sheriff says uh, you have to give the deed to your house because we're giving them amnesty, they have a right to be there. I have a little bit of a problem with that. <laughs> Uh, you know, it, it, this this is not a laughing matter. It, you know, it, it's it's interesting. Everything keeps on coming back to the Constitution, Article Four, Section Four. States, the federal government's job is to protect the borders. The federal government is not doing their job, and why they're not doing their job, I don't know. But I'm sorry, but I I really get I'm not pissed off at you guys, but I'm really pissed off at the guys back in Washington who are drawing a fancy salary and not doing their job. Now, back on to the um, anchor babies. Anchor babies. A lot of people quote the, uh, quotes, uh, the uh, 14th Amendment. It had to do with disposition of slavery. Anchor babies, if anything the government should do is address that issue and say, you cannot come here one day, have a baby, and then I have time from the last time. <laughs> you can't come here, have a baby, and declare that baby an American citizen. You need to go through the process. Thank you.